Good morning, everybody. Yesterday was a tough day. We had the funeral service for a good man we lost, Detective Anastasio Sacos. And we all joined together with his family to say goodbye. And it was so painful to see this beautiful family, two young children, a grieving widow, all going through so much. Um, and we all felt it with them. And here's someone who served us and did so much for all of us, posthumously promoted to detective, one of so many honors he deserves, and a true hero. Uh, we all are grieving with him and his family. We're grieving with the family in honor of him. But we can do more than just grieve. We can act to fight the scourge that took his life, which is driving while intoxicated, reckless driving, dangerous driving. We can do something about it. The fact is the laws are still too lenient towards those who take a vehicle and turn it into a de facto weapon and drive under the influence without any regard for what it could mean for other human beings and for families. So a family now is missing a father, a husband, a son, a brother, because someone drove under the influence. So in honor of Detective Sakos, there's something we all can do, and our colleagues in Albany in the legislature can do. We need to pass immediately in this legislative session the Crash Victim Rights and Safety Act. This legislation takes very aggressive action against dangerous driving. This legislation does much more to support the victims of these crashes. This legislation mirrors the spirit and the approach we've taken here in New York City successfully with Vision Zero, which now, by the way, the Biden administration is using the New York City model of Vision Zero as the national framework for how to protect pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, everyone. We've got to do things differently. So in this bill, the Traffic Crash Victim Bill of Rights. In this bill, Sammy's Law. And this is named after a young man, 12-year-old, killed by a dangerous driver in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, 12 years old, whole life ahead of him, his life taken away because someone didn't do the right thing. And this bill would lower the legal blood alcohol level from 0.08 to 0.05. Every step to tighten up the law helps us to stop dangerous driving, driving while intoxicated. Also, this legislation overturns the ridiculous rule of two, which literally suggests that if you do two dangerous things, you've done something wrong, as opposed to one dangerous, horrible thing being enough. So this is an opportunity to make profound change. And I'm calling upon our colleagues in Albany. I'm pleading with you in the memory of Detective Sakos, in the memory of Sammy, in the memory of all those we've lost, please pass this legislation and help make the people of New York safe. We also in the city will continue to be announcing additional Vision Zero measures. We're investing a lot in Vision Zero in the budget we're working on right now. This is work that never ends, and we'll have a lot more to say on this in the next few weeks. Okay, let's go to what we talk about every day. Our vaccination effort continues to grow, and the numbers keep mounting, and it's a lot of work. We have to keep working even harder at it, but we keep moving forward every day. So as of today, from the very beginning, 6,737,641 doses administered. The walk-in initiative, crucial. I want to remind everyone, at the city-run sites, over 50 sites across the city, walk right in. If you got an appointment, that's great. If you don't, just walk right in. Easiest it's ever been to get the vaccination. If you haven't gotten it, this is the day to get it. If you want to make an appointment or you need more information, go to nyc.gov slash vaccine finder, or you can call 877-VAX4NYC. And we want to have a great summer in this city. We want to have a lot of our freedom back and our joy back 
to help us get there, you need to get vaccinated for everyone's sake, your own, your families, your whole cities. Now, good news, a big milestone hit at City Field on Monday. City Field has been a great part of our vaccination effort. I want to thank the Mets. They've been outstanding partners. So as of Monday, we hit 100,000 doses administered at City Field. It is easy to get a vaccination at City Field. Things are working. It is the right place to go. Everything's clicking. Go to City Field, get that shot. That's easy. What's not so easy? Getting run support for Jacob deGrom. This continues to be a deeply troubling issue. Uh, we're going we're gonna to come up with innovative new solutions in addition to the previously announced Jacob deGrom support plan. Okay, now let's talk about our recovery. Let's talk about our recovery for all of us, because recovery for all of us means bringing back the whole city, every neighborhood, for everyone. A recovery for all of us means people are safe and people can go about their lives. A recovery for all of us means that we change some of the things we used to do and we make them better. So one of the things we're focused on especially is different approaches, new approaches to public safety. We want this to be the summer where New York City comes back strong. We announced our Safe Summer NYC initiative. It is about investing in communities. It's about cops in the right places. It's about bringing back the court system, gun prosecutions, all of this coming together to beat back gun violence. Well, that investment in communities is crucial. And we have learned over the years more and more that community-based solutions to violence make all the difference. This is the cure of violence movement and the crisis management system. This counts. And in this budget, we will be doubling the workforce this year for this summer for the cure violence movement, the crisis management system, and then we'll be tripling it for the summer of 2022. Today, we want to talk about a very specific effort to fight gun violence in a targeted way in a place that needs the additional help that's gotten a lot of community support in Southeast Queens, focusing on the 105 precinct, Laurelton, Rosedale, Springfield Gardens, a place where we needed to take this approach and apply it. So it's a $1.1 million investment to specifically stop gun violence with these grassroots approaches. We're investing in two groups that are known and respected in the community that have a connection to the grassroots and can make a difference. King of Kings and 100 Suits for 100 Men, two extraordinary community organizations that are going to take what works in the cure violence movement and the crisis management system and apply it in Southeast Queens and keep the community safe and help young people on the right path and help stop the violence. I want you to hear more about this. First, a uh, new council member from the community. Uh, she has hit the ground running. If you've ever seen an elected official hit the ground running, she is the definition of it. She came in to the council just as we were working on all the police reform measures. She really helped. She contributed to it. She focused us on specifically uh, improving and expanding cure violence in her part of Queens. She is a solution-oriented leader and a problem solver. <laughs> My pleasure to introduce council member Selvina Brooks Powers. Good morning and thank you so much, Mayor de Blasio, once again, continuing to invest in um, communities that have much need. And so first I'd like to thank all of our Southeast Queens elected officials, clergy leaders, as well as our civic organizations um, for the work around combating gun violence in our community. It really has taken all of us working together and the expansion of the Cure Violence CMS builds upon this collective effort from, the, from every corner of our community. For several years, we've had wonderful partners in Far Rockaway with Rock Safe Streets that quite honestly only covered a 10 block radius, but because of their commitment to the community, they have and continue to go above and beyond, responding to shootings across the peninsula in Redfern and Hamill houses, providing food distribution and much needed job opportunities. Expansion of the Cure Violence services in Southeast Queens and Far Rockaway is a major step forward. The infusion of this funding will expand not only the resources for Rock Safe Street exponentially and bring new resources to parts of Southeast Queens, 
And this announcement could not have quite honestly been more timely. Last night, I attended the Concerned Citizens of Laurelton meeting, and I was asked, what are you gonna, or what are we gonna do about the increase in shootings happening in the community? And just two days ago in Springfield Gardens, there were shots fired where there were three shells recovered. Gun violence in the 105th precinct is up with seven shootings compared to three shootings the same time last year. Now the 105th precinct will have its own cure violence program with two trusted partners, the King of Kings Foundation with Lance and Todd Furtado and 100 Suits for Men with Kevin Livingston covering parts of Southeast Queens to really begin addressing the uptick in gun violence we've been seeing. These are two groups that I've watched perform the work in the community, even when the cameras were not rolling. The King of Kings Foundation was one of the first recipients of Operation Snug funding, a statewide anti-violence initiative I've worked along, and I had the opportunity and, and privilege of working alongside both Lance and Todd and a number of statewide partners in this movement to bring an end to gun violence. And Kevin provides so much support to returning residents seeking employment and social services. Both organizations have done phenomenal work in the Southeast Queens communities, connecting those going down the wrong path to these critical services and literally changing the trajectory of their lives for the better. Gun violence leads to loss of life, whether as the victim or as the shooter. The lives that are impacted are changed forever and the impact leaves a lasting toll on families in our community. When we look to end gun violence, we have to look at the root causes and the Cure Violence Program provides a community centric model to intervene and protect. And as the summer nears, we have to ensure our streets are safe and everyone, excuse me, is safe for everyone. And this is a step towards what I hope will be and will provide for much safer streets for us all. So Mr. Mayor, I thank you once again for prioritizing much needed resources for the Southeast Queens and Rockaway community. So thank you so much. Thank you, council member, and thank you. I can tell how much this is passionate work for you to work with community residents to make things better. And I really appreciate what you said when there's an act of violence, everyone is affected, everyone's lives change. We've got to stop that violence with community-based solutions. So thank you. And now, everyone, I want to hear from someone who created one of those community-based solutions. And I really admire when folks see a problem and they say, if there's not a solution, we're going to create one. We're going to make something new. We're going to bring the community together and be part of the change we need. It takes a lot of spirit, a lot of heart to say, I'm going to step forward. I'm going to make the difference. And our next speaker is someone who did that, <clears throat> founder and president of 100 suits for 100 men. They'll be playing a crucial role in stopping violence in the 105th precinct. My pleasure to introduce Kevin Livingston. Thank you so much, Mayor. I really appreciate you for having me on. Um, Mayor, I, I must say, I wanna start by thanking our elected officials out here for believing in what we're doing. I wanna thank our sister Erica Ford and the leadership at Rock Safe Street for what they do on a daily basis. Um, you know, this is a passion project for myself, and I can speak for Lance Furtado and Todd uh, from King of Kings. We are incredibly excited to get the resources to really, really, really get in front of our young people and to make sure that they have the resources in place to take them to the next step. Um, my experiences working within the Rikers Island ACS Children's Center, as well as my partners over at uh, King of Kings, we will have the expertise to really get out there and get in front of the gun violence and make sure that it does not go to uh, places where it don't need to go. Um, I'm, I'm excited to create job opportunities for our youth, to continue to create job opportunities for our youth, and to make sure that we foster them with, uh, with, with surrounding services and resources to make sure that their lives are better. Um, I can't be more happy. I thank again Councilmember uh, Savina Brooke Powers for really believing in what we're doing, but we're ready to get to work, right? We already started work. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, Laurelton, we will be hugging on you and loving on you. 105th Priest and within your confines, you have two community group organizations that are ready to get started and we'll continue to put our young people first and make sure we end the systemic gun violence in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. And Kevin, thank you again. That takes, it takes so much to say you're going to create something, make it work. You've done that. Your colleagues have done that. 
It's making a difference. It's going to be one of the reasons we turn things around this summer, and you're going to save lives. And I just want to thank you for the profound work you're doing. God bless you. Thank you. Thank and God you. bless you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, let's do what we do every day now, and let's turn to our indicators. And again, we have had uh, weeks of good indicators. Today is no exception. Let's keep going. And I keep saying it, if you like these good indicators, if you like the fact that things are getting better, if you like fewer and fewer restrictions, and you haven't yet gotten vaccinated, go get vaccinated. So here we go. Number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 121 patients. Uh, so obviously well below threshold. Confirmed positivity also has gotten a lot lower, 37.19%. Hospitalization rate also well below threshold, 1.61 per 100,000. So that's good news all along. Number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Well, that graph speaks for itself. Continued progress. Today's report, 1,083 cases. Number three, percentage of people testing citywide positive for COVID-19. Today's report, 2.61%, again, way below threshold and declining. So that's good news all around. Few words in Spanish as we conclude. And this is about, again, how we work together with the community to end gun violence. No podemos recuperar una ciudad para todos sin vecindarios seguros. Por eso, tenemos que eliminar la violencia armada. El movimiento Cure Violence ayuda a mantener la paz y estamos lanzando una expansión importante en el sureste de Queens. Su ciudad está trabajando para proteger a su familia. Juntos, haremos que nuestra ciudad sea más fuerte y segura que nunca. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Choksi and by Dr. Katz. First question today goes to Marla from WCBS 880. Good morning, Mayor, and good morning, everyone on the call. How are you, uh, Marla? Good, how you doing? I'm feeling OK. We're, we're moving forward. OK. All right. Uh, well, I'm a middle schooler that's sitting on the carpet with no uh, no synchronous education. But anyway, <laughs> that's besides the point. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the Department of Education changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day and when the decision was made to add Italian Heritage Day uh, to Indigenous Peoples Day on the calendar. and and. Can we get your feelings as an Italian American on erasing Christopher Columbus's name from the calendar? We heard from a lot of elected officials who say that it's it's an affront and they're angry about it. Uh, look, I think uh, this process wasn't handled right. Uh, I certainly didn't hear about the change, nor did the chancellor. So we spoke about it and we both agreed this was not the right way to handle things. Um, Saying very clearly that we honor Italian Americans, I'm an Italian American, I could not be more proud. Uh, I focus on my heritage all the time. Uh, you know, I honor my grandparents, Giovanni and Anna, who came here from southern Italy. I've been to their hometowns. I could not feel my heritage more strongly. Uh, we have to honor that day as a, a day to recognize the contributions of all Italian Americans. So, of course, the, the day should not have been changed arbitrarily. I think saying it's a day to celebrate Italian American heritage is absolutely right and appropriate, and that's the way to talk about it and to think about it. I think also saying, as has been done in many parts of the country, it's a day to think about history and honor indigenous people as well. I agree with that too. So the process wasn't right, but the end result that it's going to be a day to honor Italian American heritage, a day to honor indigenous peoples, I think that's you know, a good way forward. Go ahead, Marla. Uh, Councilman uh, Mark Levine tweeted today uh, that we're not paying enough attention to the steep decline in vaccination with a 67% drop in first shots compared to peak and 45% of uh, New York City adults uh, still haven't gotten their shots. What What is the city going to do about that? You have talked about incentivizing people, but 
we haven't seen it thus far. Yeah, and you're right exactly, Marla. And so I'd say two things. I think Councilmember Levine is right to say we've got to change our approach given some of the new facts. I think you're right to say you haven't seen the new incentives yet, and we want to show them to you very quickly. We're, we're nailing down the final details, but you're going to be seeing a lot more. Uh, we know there's a lot of places where we could create really exciting opportunities. I mean, the, the other day, what we did with the Museum of Natural History is, a, is the shape of things to come. You know, folks are coming there, getting vaccinated under the blue whale, and then getting four free admissions to the museum. We're gonna be working uh, across the spectrum, sports teams, entertainment venues, restaurants. We're gonna be looking to do incentives just like that uh, to give people great opportunities when they get vaccinated. Uh, so that's exciting. We're going to have that real soon. I would say to you, Marla, um, yeah, we, we've seen the rate go down, but we still have to recognize a lot of people are getting vaccinated. And I don't want that to be missed in this situation. I was looking at the national numbers the other day, and you still got millions of people getting vaccinated every single day. Uh, once upon a time, we would have thought that to be a miracle. You know, we, I remember when we thought it was a big deal if we could get to one million vaccinations in a day in this country. We're well, well above that now. Uh, the same thing here. We now have places get vaccinated all over the city. A source with the Attorney General's office last week said, you know, they think the more appropriate options here would be the Department of Investigation or um, the city's um, uh, Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, have you heard from either of those agencies? Uh, is there any agency on the city level that you know of that's going to be looking into this? Um, is there any update you could give us on that? My understanding is Department of Investigation did say publicly they did not think they had jurisdiction because he wasn't a city official at the time. Um, I don't know about human rights. I think it's a, it's a fair question, and we can check on that. I thought uh, Attorney General might be an appropriate venue, but again, I don't, I don't know the nuances. I, I still think there's time to get the facts out uh, and the truth out, the full truth, whatever it is that people deserve to know as much as possible, uh, as independently as possible as they make their judgment on the next mayor. I think that's the bottom line. The next is Aaron from Politico. Mr. Mayor, I um, just wanted to get your reaction to uh, Governor Cuomo announcing uh, May 19th as the date that most restrictions will be lifted. Obviously, you had uh, identified July 1st. So do you think the 19th is okay? Do you think it's too early? Do you have any concerns? Um, and how do you think uh, it's going to work under the model he's uh, kind of put out of no capacity restrictions, but you still have to do social distancing? Aaron, look, uh, I think what the city announced July 1st, full reopening, uh, makes all the sense in the world because it gives us some more time to uh, keep an eye on the trends. It gives us more time to get people vaccinated as we originally planned through the end of June. Uh, it's also a full reopening. That's what I'm talking about, a, react a reopening with very, very few restrictions. Uh, what the governor's put forward we'll work with is the bottom line. Uh, it's obviously different things in different phases. Uh, we'll work with it, but we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, we'll keep an eye to make sure that the data and the science tells us everything's okay. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's why we go over these indicators every day. And if we see something wrong, we'll talk about what needs to be done to make the adjustment. But, you know, hopefully all these plans lead us to the exact same place, uh, a fully reopened New York City this summer. And I really do think we're poised for an extraordinary summer this, in this city of just a huge amount of activity and the city coming back to life. And I'm very, very excited about that. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I, I can probably guess the answer to this, but did he consult you on this decision at all? Aaron, I know you'll be shocked, shocked and amazed. I hope you're sitting down. No, he didn't. Go ahead. <laughs> the next is Odalis from Telemundo. Uh, good, good morning, Mayor. Hey, Odalis, um, how are you? Nice and nice talking to you today, Mayor. Um, I wanted to talk about immigration and the border. As more mi uh, migrants, uh, kids in, in this case, are crossing to come to the United States, is Biden administration have reached out to the city to be able to accommodate some of these children until they're reunited with relatives? 
Um, Odalis, I don't have all the details for you. I can tell you that our broad message to the Biden team is we think uh, it's so important uh, to keep families together and it's so important to avoid the mistakes made by the Trump administration where families were separated, kids were sent all over. Sometimes they weren't reunited. So we'll work with them in every way, but I think uh, we would need a very different approach than what was used in the past. Go ahead, Odalis. Thank you. Um, vaccination is going well, but the numbers are showing sort of like a slowdown of the people going to get the first shot. What more can the city do to encourage people to get vaccinated? Connecticut, in this case, is doing an amazing job. Also the city, but we need to encourage more people, especially in those uh, counties that are much needed. Yes, Odalis, you're right. Look, I think we should be proud of where we are. Uh, you know, we've got a huge, huge number of vaccinations that have been done, uh, and very successfully. You know, the process has worked. You know, the, the team has done a great job. All those wonderful vaccinators out there, I want to thank them again. Uh, it's been very safe. Uh, we've seen just a great, great track record. And if you talk about people who have gotten at least one dose, we're almost 74% uh, on the way to our 5 million person goal. And overwhelmingly, people get one dose, do come back to get a second dose. So there are actually some very, very good uh, facts here. But Odalis, you're right, we got to do more. I think this is going to be about um, focusing on the doctors and pediatricians reaching out more consistently to their patients. You know, let's face it, no voice is more important to people than the doctor they trust. For a parent, the pediatrician's voice is so important. I think more of that contact, getting that encouragement will make a difference. Definitely more incentives, and we're going to say a lot more about that in the next few days. Uh, a lot of exciting incentives. Um, and I think continuing to educate people. And also, I think we're going to hear news in the next days confirming that uh, hundreds of thousands of more people are now going to be eligible. Kids uh, 12 to 15, I think, are going to be eligible very, very soon. That's a whole other audience we need to reach. So I think if you put all those pieces together, we really get somewhere. The next is Yoav from the city. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I just wanted to clarify on the um, on the change of uh, the, the Columbus Day holiday name. Um, you, you said the chancellor wasn't aware of it either. H how did that announcement get made without the chancellor's um, input? Yeah, again, uh, Yoav, we've got a, obviously a huge, huge operation. And in that operation, um, there's a lot of different elements. So the fact that a calendar naming didn't come to her attention or my attention, on one hand, doesn't surprise me. But it was not the right thing to do. We needed to hear about it, and we needed to make sure it was right. The original uh, idea wasn't sufficient, and we addressed that. Go ahead, Yoav. Um, somewhat relatedly, one of the action items, one of the few action items that came out of your um, statue review committee um, back in 2018 was a uh, decision to add some markers to the Columbus statue at, at Columbus Circle and also to commission a monument um, honoring Native Americans, most likely to be placed in Central Park. Uh, it's, it's been three years. What, what's the status of that and, and why is that taking so long? Good question. Obviously, the last year plus everything's been thrown off by the pandemic, but I think it's a fair question. Let me get you an update right away on where all those pieces stand. Uh, we do, in everything we do, I think the Monuments Commission did really important work, really hard work, and their idea was strike a balance in all things and, and show the different perspectives on history, so we want to follow through on that. We'll get you an update right away. The next is Abu from Bangla Patrika. Um, hello, Mayor. How are you? Good, Abu. How you been? Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor, I, I would like to know the, um, the Pfizer is going to uh, get the permission, hopefully, uh, for 12, uh, 2 to 12 years old kids. Um, how city is preparing and um, what kind of 
program they have to motivate the kids as well to get the vaccine. Uh, I'll start, uh, Abu, and I want to turn to Dr. Choksi. Uh, this is going to be an important new development. Look, I'm speaking as a parent now. Um, if my kids were in that age range, that 12 to 15 age range, uh, and the news came through that they could get a Pfizer vaccine, uh, the second it was approved, I'd be at one of those vaccination centers with my child to get them uh, protected. I think a lot of parents are going to react that way. Um, but I do think there's also a lot of questions people have, a lot we have to do. We have to work closely with pediatricians in particular. I think that's going to make the biggest difference. Dr. Choksi, why don't you talk about that initiative? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have a three-pronged plan that is ready to go um, as soon as uh, we hear about the green light um, from the FDA and the CDC with respect to using Pfizer for 12 to 15-year-olds. Uh, the first part of it is leveraging our existing infrastructure, the clinics, the hospitals uh, that already have Pfizer, uh, to make sure that they're prepared for some of the special considerations for uh, that younger age group, particularly the consent requirements associated with it. The second part of the plan is uh, to work very actively with pediatricians who may not be currently part of our vaccination efforts, but who will be critically important to have these conversations with parents um, and get, uh, get adolescents vaccinated as well. And the third part is very importantly working with our colleagues in the Department of Education to ensure that we're communicating through schools uh, with parents uh, in the mechanisms and the avenues you know, that they're already aware of. The final thing that I'll say, if I understood your question correctly, Abu, you were also asking about the two to 12 uh, year uh, age range. And Pfizer did indicate yesterday that they're um, planning to submit uh, results uh, from that later on in the summer. And it could be uh, authorized for use in children younger than 12 as soon as September of this year. So we'll, of course, have to follow all of that out and see the data ourselves. Um, but that's certainly a very promising development for later in 2021. Thank you, Dave. Go ahead, Abu. Second question is the same kind. Uh, is the uh, is this vaccine will be same like you know the uh, for the adult or it will be a different kind of uh, vaccine uh, for kids? Uh, I'm going to turn back to Dr. Choksi. My understanding is it's exact same vaccine, same approach. But Dr. Choksi, you can explain. That's exactly right. It's the same vaccine for adults and for children. Excellent. We have time for two more for today. The next is Dave Carlin from WCBS. Hey, Mayor. Hey, hey Dave. Carlin. How you doing? I'm real good. I have a question for you about uh, what we're seeing on West 36th Street and at some other hotels in the Times Square area. And they appear to be real busy cleaning and renovating. And now we're being told that this is because removing the homeless from them appears to be imminent. Now, is that the case? Uh, Dave, I don't know that particular hotel you're referring to. I can tell you, I've said for a long time, as the situation improves uh, and we have less and less of an issue with COVID, of course we intend uh, to return folks who remain homeless back to shelters where they can get the best support. That's been the plan from day one. Uh, so we'll have more to say on that uh, when the right moment comes. Uh, but unquestionably, that will happen sooner rather than later because that's been the plan all along. Go ahead, Dave. If, if there's any kind of threshold or schedule for that, because, uh, you know, we appreciate that you've said soon, eventually, um, is there any kind of uh, idea that it, it comes within weeks, months? Well, it, it's definitely connected, Dave. It's connected to uh, the healthcare situation overall. Obviously, we're looking for the sign off of the health department and Dr. Choksi. Uh, we're looking at any appropriate uh, federal and state guidance we have to uh, align to. I think the bottom line is as more and more people get vaccinated, as COVID is pushed back, we're getting close to that point where we can act, but we've got to get all the different pieces together. So we will certainly be talking about it, Dave. I think if part of your question is, you know, are we going to talk about it when the time comes and, and be open and transparent? Of course. Uh, but we're not at that point just yet. I do think it's coming soon. By definition, as I said, if we're looking at July 1st as a time for a full reopening, uh, we expect a lot of things to be acted on by that time. 
Last question for today it goes to Gersh from Streets Blog. Hello, Mayor. How are you? Gersh, I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm living the dream. My my son is in remote learning, so uh, he's learning nothing. But that's fine. We can talk about that tomorrow. Uh, you know, Gersh, you do have a pension for the sound bite. Well, I, I'm the, I'm the last call today, and everybody's hung up, so we can just talk like gentlemen. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, just as in other calls, just as in other press conferences, there have been discussions of shootings around the city and what you intend to do about them. But as you well know from your seven-year Vision Zero campaign, there are far more injuries caused by car drivers than by gunmen. Roughly 140 New Yorkers are injured every day by car drivers. And your call for state legislation is a part of the solution, no question about that. And you should be proud to know that one of the safest places in the city right now is the open street that you created on 34th Avenue in Jackson Heights, where crashes are down 80% during the hours when the barricades are in place to prevent through car traffic. So, I don't know if you know this, residents of that neighborhood have started a new petition drive on Sunday. They started this calling on the city to turn 34th Avenue into a linear park. And as you know, parks contribute so much to our mental health, our physical health from pollution, and of course, from crashes. So what do you think of this proposal to turn what your own DOT calls the gold standard of open streets into a linear park? Uh, I think it's an interesting proposal. I think we clearly, look, Gersh, we are learning every day and changing all the time, and that's good. Um, there are places, we've talked about before, where we'll be doing different approaches uh, in terms of pedestrian spaces, for example. So we're going to look at a whole lot of different options. Some places we might say, here's something we want to do permanently. Other places we'd say, here's something we want to do temporarily. Um, but we're constantly looking to do more because it's working. So I take this as a helpful nomination. I'm glad you raised it. And uh, we'll look at it. I'll talk to DOT about it. And we'll come back and let you know what we're thinking. Go ahead, Gersh. You know, as a follow-up, I'd like to get Dr. Choksi to comment as well because you know, the Department of Health could do so much more to demand car-free spaces for residents, given research that shows the negative health and mental health impact of pollution, noise, and obviously the crashes caused by cars and car drivers. In my extensive back and forth with the Health Department press office, I have not been made aware of anything the Department of Health has done under Dr. Choksi or his predecessor to combat the crucial public health crisis of cars. So let me uh, turn to Dr. Choksi, but Gersh, uh, again, I really do appreciate you've raised a lot of important issues over the last few years, and many of them have helped us to focus on changes we can make. So this is, I, I dare say it's advocacy journalism, but it's productive advocacy journalism, and I appreciate it. I would say at the same time, health department has been part of the most fundamental change we've made, which is Vision Zero. And I really want to come back to this. We, this city decided to do something that almost no place else in America did, said we're reorienting our entire strategy, and it has worked, and we're going to go a lot deeper with it, and now it's become the national template. So I, I do think the fact that this city was moving in a very forceful direction to change the reality of street safety is something the health department saw and liked and approved of, and it did not happen before we came along. With that, I turn to Dr. Choksi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I think that's exactly right. There has been uh, so much that has been done uh, by the administration to ensure that the way that we think about um, the spaces uh, and, uh, you know, the places where uh, we are um, evolving, you know, our transportation infrastructure, uh, do so with health in mind. Um, we serve as a key technical partner for the Department of Transportation um, in a number of different avenues, you know, to actually do that. We study the impact of, uh, of noise uh, on health. Um, we think about the ways in which the built infrastructure, uh, you know, can contribute to health outcomes. And I'm grateful that you pointed out that this is not just about physical health, but about uh, mental health as well. Um, and I do think that we have an opportunity to carry that forward as we emerge from the pandemic. So I'd be happy to speak uh, with you more about that, Gersh. Thank you so much, Dave. Hey, as we conclude, everyone, look, this comes back to a crucial point. We all together innovated 
open streets, innovated, open restaurants. We now are putting the pieces in place for an extraordinary summer and the streets of New York City. It's going to be, I think, greater than anything we've ever seen before because it's going to combine so many wonderful new outdoor activities, opportunities, but also people feeling that camaraderie, that sense that we're coming back together. We're creating a recovery for all of us together. Everyone is going to be a part of the comeback story of New York City. Again, you want to do something right now to make sure it's going to be an amazing summer? Go out and get vaccinated because we all deserve the greatest summer ever in New York City, and you can help to make it happen. Thank you, everybody.